What's up, everybody? How are we doing today? Oh, let me pin something in here real quick. Let me pin Expo West. That's what we're talking about. Who's going to Expo West? Let me know in the comments if you're heading to Expo West. All right, dope. So a little bit about Expo West for all you don't know. First of all, shout out to some of you I see who are in here right now. We met in person out in Vegas. Congratulations on taking the opportunity to take the initiative and move forward with making those travel arrangements because it's a commitment that you make as a business owner to kind of get out of your comfort zone and grow your company, right? And Expo West is the same thing. It's the same thing. It's a brand new opportunity to meet with new manufacturers, distributors, and specifically brands to branch out and to grow your company. So if you're not there, you're not making the magic happen, right? And I understand some of you may have not have heard me talk about it in the past, or you're like, oh man, it's tomorrow, I can't get out there in time. That's okay, there are future events to attend, but it's important that you're attending these events. It's important, you gotta be attending these events. You gotta be in the industry to know what's going on and what's going down in the industry to make moves to continue to excel within that industry, if that makes sense. So if we got any questions here, I'd be happy to help. Any questions about Expo West, if you're going out there, that's great. What's the hottest new industry? So right now, I just actually got off a call with, with one of our Inner Circle members. BCAAs are trending right now. There's so many companies creating them. Uh, super competitive as well. Uh, but that's really why I love going to trade shows like Expo West, because every year you go, you're gonna see they have a whole entire room with hundreds of brands in it. It's called the Hot Products Room, right? So in that room is every single company who's got the hot products that are trending right now. So you get to see the trends within the industry when you go to these events. And I know like back in 2018, it was cheese crisps and then it was nut milks. You know, everybody had an almond milk or a, a pecan milk or a cashew milk. Like everybody had a nut milk. Shelf stable milks was huge as well. Two years ago, it was like jerky. All these new companies came out with all these different types of processes to cure jerky and make jerky. And it was huge, right? And then you see as these trends come and go, there's a lot of opportunity within them to capitalize on them. So that's a great question. What's the most important thing to attend these events? The most important reason to attend a, a live trade show or live Amazon event or just a networking event would be for the people. I go for the people, 100% I go for the people. Talking to the people, learning about their businesses, asking them questions about their companies, just gaining as much information as I can from as many people as I can in as many places as I go, I think really allows me to become a more well-rounded individual. And if you do things like that, it will allow you to become a more well-rounded individual. But in order to do that, you have to make a commitment to be willing to invest in yourself. Because to get to these events, you know, unless you live close by and you can drive, you gotta book the airfare and the hotel and a rental car if you need one, or you pay for the Ubers, right? But to me, the way I see it after years of doing this, it's such a small, small expense in the grand scheme of the growth of me as a human and also me as a business owner because that's what the goal is. I'm not only trying to grow my Amazon sales, I'm trying to grow this every day, right? Because if I can grow my mind and my body and my spirit and become a more well-rounded person, I think collectively as the days go by, I become a better human. And it's really that simple, but we overcomplicate it. Right, because we put all these limitations on the growth and the potential growth we can experience because sometimes we just don't believe in ourselves. So getting over that is a, is a simple solution. It's really just making the commitment and saying I am worthy and I can do whatever I set out to do as long as I apply myself. And then you're ready to rock and then you just go for it. And if you fail, you pick yourself up and you try it again. You know, and if you fail, you pick yourself up and you try it again. Most businesses, including mine, was built on a lot of failures, a lot of mistakes, a lot of trials and tribulations. Gas is too high? You know what? It's funny, uh, glistening shine. I was gonna post about this today, but I, I don't like getting involved with like the controversial, you know, politics and stuff like that. But, and, and what I was gonna discuss, I'll discuss it right here briefly, but it was, I, I don't care what the gas prices are. 
you know, and, and, and now that I've been looking at these gas prices, it just made me realize how much more I need to capitalize on the opportunity of building something for myself, continuing to grow what I have built, right? And build it as big as it can be. Because like, nobody gives a fuck at the end of the day about what Eric's getting. Right, I have to make my path. I have to create my path and take that path. And if I'm not willing to do that, if you're not willing to do that, then it doesn't matter. You'll have a million jobs working for a million bosses, just jumping job to job to job, right? Worrying about gas prices. That's not how I want to live my life. That's absolutely not how I want to live my life. I don't want to worry about the price of gas. So the decisions I make on a daily basis provide me the income where I don't have to look at the price of gas because I never want gas to be a, a reason for me not doing something. Does that make sense? Uh, noticing distributors wanting me to have a warehouse to deliver to. Yeah, it's common. Listen, not all distributors will require it but it becomes a complicated relationship if you're trying to ship to residential. It really does, you know? So it's something you gotta work around in the beginning. You could work around it by leveraging prep centers. You could leverage Amazon Prep. You can ask your distributors if they offer prep services. You could get it shipped to a local UPS store, which would technically be a business address and not a PO box. So that's a way around uh, getting pallets shipped to you. You could also use a local business address. Say you know someone who owns a warehouse or has a store uh, that can receive pallets or trucks. You just be like, hey, you know, I'll pay you a hundred bucks uh, if I could get this delivery dropped off at your place and use your address, right? So there's some opportunity there. You just kind of got to think outside the box and be willing to do what most people are unwilling to do. Um, and he said he's had some distributors let him come up and or come to their warehouse and pick up the orders others don't want me to yeah some companies they just you know whatever they're doing they just don't want you in their business you know i know i'm like that i don't want very rarely do i let anybody come over to our you know wholesale company it's just because it's they don't need to be there are you seeing lots of listings with record numbers of new sellers on them now? Yeah, I see a lot of listings like this. It doesn't concern me. I'm not really in the RA space, so this is very common, and I'm assuming that you're probably doing a lot of RA or OA because it's it's super common. You see a, a great listing, you're making 10 bucks on it, there's seven, eight sellers, you're like, I'm gonna crush it, and two weeks later, you know, because with all these Discord groups, with all these lead lists, it's like, Two weeks later, it goes from seven sellers to 57 sellers, you know, and now the price, you're not making $10, you're making $1.50, you know, and then two weeks after that, you're not making any money, you're losing money, and there's 67 sellers. So like, it's very common with OA and RA, and that's why we don't like to really do that anymore, um, unless we get a crazy deal that we see at a store and we get like, a full truckload, half truckload, we'll make that happen. Uh, but it's common when you're doing online arbitrage, retail arbitrage, see crazy, crazy numbers of sellers. And really when I'm analyzing listings, because I'm all FBA, right? If you're all FBA and you're doing volume, a lot of times I don't even consider those RA and OA sellers as competitive sellers. Because there might be 50 sellers on a listing, but how many are actually buy box competitive? And how many even have more than five units? Probably not a lot of them. When you look at their inventory count, it's a lot of twos and threes because they're buying them at Walmarts and stuff. You know, they don't have the access like some of those wholesale guys do and girls do to, to purchase large volume. So they're just eating the little scraps, which is cool too. You know, it's a great way to continue to grow, but it's not something that if you're 100% wholesale, buying products at large volume, that you should even be concerned about. All right, that's a good question. How do you fix a mixing skew problem? I follow the steps Amazon recommends. It says updates received, but the listing doesn't appear on the manage inventory page. So number one solution, my go-to solution is copy the merchant skew, copy the ace and save it somewhere, whether you email it to yourself, put it in a Word doc, et cetera. Excel doc, Google doc, doesn't matter. You just want to have access to it. Then you go into Seller Central, you delete the listing. You wait 15, 20 minutes until it's completely deleted for your inventory. You go back into Seller Central and you recreate that listing using the same merchant SKU. And that same merchant SKU will essentially refresh the listing and your same amount of units will be available. Now, there are some instances where a missing SKU just cannot be fixed, right? After weeks or sometimes even months of communication with Amazon, back and forth, they keep telling you different steps to take, you take them all, it just doesn't get fixed. In that instance, instead of wasting more time figuring it out, more back and forth, waiting a longer period of weeks or even months, we just pull that inventory back, we'll recreate a brand new listing for it, 
all right, or brand new skew under the same ASIN, and then that will refresh the process. So yeah, you gotta pay a little money to get the inventory back, but instead of dealing with the back and forth, it's usually the best option. Well said, how do I find suppliers? Google, my friend, Google's your number one friend. Also, I'm sure a lot of you are driving around in whatever city you live in, town you live in, you're driving right by trucks every single day on the road that have a huge sign on the side of them that says a distributor name and you didn't even pay attention to look at them. You know, what I do when I'm driving, I just snap a quick picture and then once I get a minute to either look at it on my phone or I get back to a desktop, I just pull up the company's information, hop on a call, hey, you know, I was just driving down the road, I saw one of your drivers, I operate a large wholesale company, I'd love to purchase some of your products, you know? Can you send me over some account information in a catalog so I can start putting together some orders? And then it's like, yeah, absolutely, you know, this guy's taking action, initiative. Uh, no, no, definitely OA and RA are not dead. Should those people move to wholesale? No, OA and RA are not dead, you know? I know listen, I know a lot of people, I was just hanging out with a lot of people in Vegas a couple days ago who operate, you know, million dollar plus OA and RA businesses. It is not dead but it's very challenging to scale past that point with OA and RA. It's just, it's too challenging. You gotta have too many people sourcing products from too many stores to make it worth it anymore. To really do the volume thing on Amazon, you gotta go the wholesale route. So, I'd like to point out that OA and RA are great for building an Amazon business initially. Great, that's how we built. You know, and then we made the transition to wholesale. Does eSellers RI work for Canadian sellers? Yes, it absolutely works for Canadian sellers. So it not only works for Canadian sellers, but it works for any seller internationally, globally, around the world. Uh, right now we have sellers in 13 different countries. And in Canada, there's probably seven to 10 sellers in our community. I was actually just in Canada about three or four weeks ago uh, doing a warehouse visit to one of our Inner Circle members who's also in eSellers RI. Um, and I spent a couple days at their warehouse helping them optimize and streamline their processes and get more efficient workstations and just really understand the ins and outs of what it takes to run an efficient operation on the back end so you can make sure you're making more money to put back into your pocket. Uh, so absolutely, yeah, we work with Canadian sellers. And if you want to jump on a quick call, if you got any additional questions, just hit me in the DMs. I'll send you a link to my calendar directly and uh, we can discuss you joining eSellers or I, absolutely. Yeah, so, so yeah, listen, hats and shoes, they're hot, you know, but the return rates aren't hot. I just don't, I personally, this is a personal opinion, do what you please, but after running the numbers and selling hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of shoes on Amazon and, you know, multiple different clothing products, we decided as a company to no longer sell apparel. Um, because of the return rates. The return rates, you know, we were getting 15 to 17%. And when you're operating on, you know, 22, 23% gross margins on, on some of these shoes, you know, after expenses and, and the, the lost cost of goods on returns, you know, you're working a lot to not make a lot of money. You know, we were putting 50, $60,000 orders in, and at the end of the day, we were making 2,000 bucks. You know, so you're talking 4% return. It's like, that's not enough. You know, I'd rather allocate that $50,000 to something that I know is gonna make me a lot more money and have a one or 2% return rate like most wholesale products have. Is there anything I can say or do to stand out from other sellers? Yeah, stop thinking about yourself. That's the number one, number one tip. And then we're gonna wrap this up in a minute here. But number one tip is stop thinking about yourself Think about the company and how you can deliver value to them. You know, I see it happen all the time. And I know when companies come to me like this, I'm more open to the relationship when they offer something and they let me know like, hey, listen, I understand this is a two-sided street and I'm willing to grow this relationship too. So I wanna let you know that if you have any deals or let's say you get excess inventory coming through, I wanna be your guy, send that to me. Send that to me first. I'll look through it. If I can move it for you, I'll do everything I can do to move that inventory for you, right? So now they're not just looking at you as a customer, you are an asset to them, right? Because now you're helping them move this inventory and then you take a couple pallets here, take a couple pallets there, even if it's not making any killer money, right? Even if you're just profiting a little, you're playing a long game here, you're looking for the long-term relationship. So yeah, you make a dollar on this, you buy 500 of them, 1,000 of them, 3,000 of them, make $2 on that, buy a couple thousand of them, and then you're really building the relationship. Most people aren't willing to do that. They just wanna reach out, hey, can I get, a, I've never spent a penny with you, but can I get a 12% discount on this product? And it's like, what? Like, no, bro, you can't get, you can't get a 12% discount 
on that product because you ain't spend no money with us. All right, that's gonna be the last question, my friends. Uh, so before we get to this, don't forget, tomorrow evening, Sebastian and I and a bunch of other members of our community will be hanging out in Anaheim, California. Uh, 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, that's tomorrow, March 9th, which is a Wednesday. We'll be out in Cali. We'd love to have you come by, say what's up. There's probably gonna be 20, 30 of us. Um, it's gonna be exciting, right? So if you live in the area or you're going to Expo West, you definitely wanna be there. I encourage you to be there. It's all about networking, meeting new people, because you never know what piece of information that person might have that's gonna make that light bulb go off, and you're gonna leave that event, and you're gonna be like, holy that guy just absolutely changed the course of my company or that woman just absolutely changed the course of my company from one little nugget of information. So you gotta be out there to get out there to grow. So we'll see you in Anaheim if you're coming through. Also, last thing, Expo West trade show walkthrough. It's happening the following day, Thursday. If you want more information on that, we walk you through the show floor. We introduce you to companies we've been doing business with for multiple years. We show you what companies to talk to, what companies not to talk to, what to say to them to make sure you're at the top tier of possibly securing that deal out of all the hundreds, if not thousands of companies that are talking to them these coming days. So we wanna make sure that you're well educated and you have what it takes to navigate this show floor. Cause if it's your first time going, I promise you, you're gonna feel lost, you're gonna feel overwhelmed, and you're gonna feel like you didn't get a lot accomplished. And how do I know this? Because I've been that person. So what's the purpose of having your own prep center warehouse? So the purpose is two reasons. First one is quality control, right? We have issues with Amazon, something's packaged incorrectly. If the prep center did it, then you gotta call the prep center, you gotta communicate with them. Did they take pictures? Did they not take pictures? Do they have the documentation? Do they not have the documentation? Did they do it correctly? If they didn't do it correctly, who's paying for it? Is the prep center paying for it? Am I paying for it, right? So to alleviate the stress of all that quality control, I prefer to have the the products come to us, so my staff is the one touching them and handling them, and I've trained them, and Sebastian have trained them on how to do it properly, efficiently, and effectively. So if there are any QC issues with the customer, we can trace the steps back all the way to exactly where it happened and make sure it doesn't repeat itself. And the second reason is expenses. You know, you figure if you're spending a dollar a unit on prep service fees, let's say you're selling at 10,000 units a month, even 8,000 units a a month you're talking eight grand in prep service fees you could probably put four grand in that into a 3,000 square foot warehouse five grand into a 3,000 square foot warehouse the other three to five grand into two to three employees and you could have your own prep center at a fraction of the cost so I'm gonna leave y'all with that hope you all have fun I appreciate your time I love hanging out with y'all have a beautiful day most importantly stay grateful and stay lit adios my friends